Hello, welcome to Insight Onsite. We're at Willamette Heritage Center for Navy Week. Well, we were very honored to be asked to have uh, not only the speaker tonight, but uh, musicians and volunteers to come on site and help us with projects. Uh, they went through Travel Salem and uh, Venata Public Relations, and they, both of those groups thought of us, that this might be a good location for them to come to. So they contacted me a few months ago, and. And just it went from there. Tell us what they did here because I was taking video of it. Just yeah. tell us what did they do? So as a nonprofit five and a half acre historic site, you can imagine we have a lot of projects that are constantly going on. We have 14 buildings that are constantly needing renovation and preservation. So we knew our facility advisory committee knew that there was one or two projects we could definitely put the sailors on. And so we have a machine shop here. And the south side of the machine shop is really worn down and it had not been replaced for probably 20 plus years. So a lot of uh, rot, a lot of wood rot, and we just needed to replace that wall. So they came in and they replaced, they got about three quarters of it done. It was a great amount of work done, yeah. That would have taken us months to do otherwise. So we just, they knocked it out really quick. And then we also had a few of them help out with some landscaping. We have five, like I say, we have five and a half acres with a lot of landscaping. We have an, an herb garden, a historic herb garden or a, a heritage herb garden for when the missionaries used to be here behind our parsonage building. We have an exhibit that shows the herbs that they would use as, as they came, you know, as they lived here and they, their daily routines. So we were trying to clean that area up so we can replant the herbs that we had there before as an exhibit space. And so those guys really helped us to clean that up as well. I, I am uh, the maintenance lead here at the Willamette Heritage Center. I've been here for a little over seven years, and we've got a lot of old buildings. The one that they're working on now was originally built in 1860, and uh, we're always looking for volunteers, and it happens to be Navy Week, and uh, they came in to give us a hand. What has and, it been like for you? What did you watch them do, and what would you really want to make sure that you'd write? <laughs> well, uh, just that it gets done and sealed back up before it rains. <laughs> We are out here on a Navy week with the USS Constitution, and today we've been, we've been given the privilege to be restoring some of these old buildings here on this site. So we're just kind of, right now we're kind of cutting down, sizing, and then uh, nailing in the wood to the side of this building. The goal is to make it look like how it did back in the day with our skills. We try to make it look like it used to. Speaking of skills, what are your skills virtually? But you all seem to be knowing what you're doing here. Yep, so a lot of what we do at the Constitution, we'll do some like restoring work of the ship. So a lot of us work in the deck department over um, on the boat. So we get a lot of skills in learning how to cut, learning how to shape and um, fix up the old ship. Yeah. 
So it's really cool being able to relate our old ship, you know, being launched in 1797 to now seeing some of these old buildings on the site, all the way from the early like, 1830s, 1840s. So it's really cool being able to see kind of like our time period ship to these old school buildings and how, you know, how well they were constructed back in the day and how they're still, you know, standing up. What to you is the most satisfying thing about doing this kind of work in communities like that? Like what satisfies me seeing this is that, you know, once you get the tourists, when you get people come out here and see this work, they're like, wow, how old has this building been here? You know, this looks really old and they're, you know, they're astonished by, you know, how good these buildings are. Worth, worth refurbishing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, I, I grew up on a farm and a lot of the work we did was, you know, building structures and building barns and stuff like that. So this is just very similar to what I was doing growing up and it's very, it's very satisfying starting with nothing and then having a finished product to be able to look at the, at the end of the day. At the Naval History of Oregon display, we learned a lot, including what it's like to crew aboard the world's first atomic submarine. Uh, my name's Thomas Palmer. I'm with HS Nautilus. So that's the first nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, it's of its own class. Uh, it was changing from diesel boats to all, all submarines are powered by nuclear power now. So that was the very first one. What is it like to serve aboard a submarine? Um, it's... How do I explain this? Uh, you go underwater for about three to four months at a time, uh, and you serve some specific type of mission. Uh, I was on a ballistic missile submarine, so we served uh, strategic uh, deterrent patrols. Uh, and you go down there, and you just wait to do things if the Navy needs you to. What kind of training does it require for you? Um, so for what I do, we do two years of training in South Carolina uh, for nuclear safety and stuff like that, because that's what I work on. Uh, and then we do um, about a year of training on board the submarine that you're like stationed to. Uh, and then you're like a full person at that point. So it's like three years of training for about three years of uh, service. How do you adapt to being in that circumstance for three months? Um, honestly, so when you get to the boat, uh, you just start working because there's always something broken or something. So you just keep on, uh, you start working and then one day you're underway and they shut the hatches and then a couple days later, it kind of hits you, they haven't seen the sun yet. And then you just get into a routine, just doing the same thing, uh, doing a patrol and then it's like four months later. <laughs> what do you like about it especially? Um, I like fixing things, and that's like my only job. Uh, so I like just problem solving and fixing things, because uh, when you're on a submarine, uh, there's only like 100 to 150 of you. Uh, so if something breaks, like it's on you to fix it. Uh, so you don't like have like a lot of help. So it's more just like figuring things out for yourself. Uh, that's why uh, submarines are like very self-sufficient. How far down do you go? Uh, we can't talk about that, <laughs> uh, but they go pretty deep, yeah, and they are also pretty fast. Uh, the Nautilus, where I'm stationed in Groton, Connecticut, uh, could go to a depth of 700 feet. Uh, we can go way deeper than that now, and it could go about 22 knots. What do you look at when you want to see something outdoors, if you know what I mean, on a submarine? Uh, you don't. Uh, <laughs> um, there were a couple times where we surfaced and we got to see... Uh, like at night, there's bioluminescence, so we got to see that a couple times. Uh, but besides that, uh, there's no windows, so you just don't see the outside or the sun for just a couple months. You just get used to it, it's fine. I was fortunate enough to get hired on the recent grads program with Navy History and Heritage Command after I finished my undergraduate degree in creative media and film. And I'm currently serving in an outreach position for Navy History and Heritage Command. Um, my favorite thing to do with this command and what I, I most am passionate about is interacting with our veterans of all branches, Navy especially because they are attracted to what we have to offer, um, but particularly our Vietnam veterans. We um, were 
just a little bit past our 50th commemoration for um, honoring our service members that served in that particular war. And I myself am, a, am an Army veteran and I served in Iraq, so I am a combat veteran. And when I got off the plane um, coming back from Iraq, I was greeted very warmly by several Vietnam veterans and their families. So it means a lot to me that I have the, um, the honor and privilege of recognizing them for their service and presenting them with the, with the um, veteran lapel pin for our, for our 50th commemoration. So, Have you met any veterans who served even earlier than Vietnam? Absolutely. I have met a handful of World War II veterans and Korean War veterans, which is uh, incredibly special because uh, you may know we're, we're losing them very, very quickly. We're at the 80th anniversary for, um, well, past 80th anniversary for uh, that particular war. So um, it's, it's incredible. They have um, a lot of stories to, to tell and I'm happy to hear them and happy to um, share what we've collected um, in History and Heritage Command in regards to that time period. Um, one of the things I do like to make people aware of of all the benefits that we have um, for History and Heritage Command. We're an excellent place for res uh, research. Um, if you're in school, we're a citable source. And we, we have an incredible website that I want to share with people with thousands of publications they can download for free. Uh, as well as 10 museums across the country that they can visit, um, again, for free. And uh, lots of great Navy history. It's important, and we want to make sure that our, our community, especially in Salem, knows that this is something that's available and out there for them. Who would have thought that Salem would have much in the way of a naval connection? It's inland. It is. Um, well, we're, we have the privilege of hearing one of our speakers coming from Puget Sound um, to discuss that very thing. So Willamette Valley history and the connection to Navy. So I'm, I'm just as excited to hear what she has to say and bring those ties into um, Salem and Oregon. So it'll be fun. How did you get involved in doing Naval history? So my passion is actually local history. I went to Willamette University. Uh, for a bachelor's degree in American history and then got a degree in museum studies which landed me at the Puget Sound Navy Museum up in Bremerton, Washington. And I really like telling the story of the Navy as it connects to local history, to people who might not see themselves as having any relationship with the Navy. Maybe people don't really know that we have much in the way of a history here, right? Sure, so, uh, you know, Oregon doesn't have a big Navy base like, say, Bremerton or San Diego, but there's actually quite a bit of Navy history here. Right here in Salem. Yes, and that history actually goes back quite a ways, all the way back to the 1840s. Uh, the, the first Naval presence here in the Pacific Northwest uh, was something called the Wilkes Expedition. It was Lieutenant Charles Wilkes and a, a whole team on about six boats came all over the world and ended up here in Oregon. All over the world? Yes. Where did they go before they got here? Uh, well, they, they really sailed all over the world, even up to Antarctica, where there's an area named for Lieutenant Wilkes. All right. Well, when they got here, what did they find? Uh, so they were actually intent on mapping the whole area that is today Oregon. Uh, so, so that ships could navigate better. So they traveled through all the waterways and then they landed uh, on land and explored everything from Fort Walla Walla to Fort Nisqually. And they even came here to Salem to visit with the missionaries here. Did they stay for a while? What did they do here then? It was a pretty quick trip uh, because they were really intent on traveling and collecting as much information as they could. So where did the Salem connection to the Navy next show up? Uh, well, uh, Oregon's connection to the Navy, uh, I think next shows up in the Spanish-American War, uh, which famously uh, was fought with the battleship USS Oregon, the, the state's mm -hmm. first namesake ship. And what about World War II? Uh, sure, so there are a lot of connections to World War II. And I think uh, the one that I learned as a student at Willamette University is the one that I'll always remember. 
Uh, so on the morning of Pearl Harbor, Willamette's football team was over in Hawaii for a big football game. And as you can imagine, they were quite looking forward to being tourists for the week. Uh, but the world, of course, had other plans for them. So following the attack on Pearl Harbor, many of those players actually stayed for as much as two weeks to serve guard duty alongside the naval uh, sailors over there who had a lot of work to be done in the aftermath. Oregon actually experienced combat action. Yes, there, there was a little bit. Yeah, uh, so there was a little bit of a Japanese submarine shelling the, the beaches. Uh, and there was also a, sadly, a balloon bomb attack. Uh, the balloon bomb was sent over from Japan and landed. And unfortunately, a pastor and his wife and a handful of children were out for a picnic and they found the balloon bomb and the wife and children unfortunately were killed by that. And that's the only uh, loss of life to enemy action that happened on the mainland of the United States during the war. What happened after the war? Was there a Navy presence here at all? <laughs> sure, so starting in the late 1940s, there was actually a training center for naval aviators at McNary Airport. So there was a handful of planes stationed here and it was basically intended so that the aviators in the Naval Reserves uh, wouldn't have to go all the way to say Portland or Seattle for training. I didn't know that. Is that that seems an unusual fact. Yeah, it's not very well recorded, but it was there for about a decade. What does this tell you about Oregon's connection to the Navy? It tells me it had a very strong connection from all of the sailors who have served from this state to the ships that have been named for Oregon and for various places in Oregon, uh, to all of the sites that have served uh, the Navy for various purposes over the years. Oregon has a very strong connection to the Navy. Thank you for joining us today on Insight Onsite. I'm Wendy Brokaw. That is a Navy band practicing before they rocked the Die House crowd at Willamette Heritage Center that night. We leave you with some concert highlights and Megan Churchwell's fascinating presentation, Sailors and Shores, Oregon's Naval Heritage. Welcome to the Willamette Heritage Center. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to have a nice little intimate conversation with Megan Churchill, who's the curator at the Puget Sound Navy Museum. Uh, so I'm, I told her I'm not going to introduce her. I'm going to let her introduce herself because she'll be able to tell you more about herself than I would. So I'll turn it over to Megan. All right. Hi, everyone. And thanks so much for joining me here tonight. Uh, so again, I'm the curator of the Puget Sound Navy Museum, which is up in Bremerton, Washington. And we're all about the Navy history of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so drawing out some of those local connections that you might not have known about uh, between local history and Navy history. Uh, and 
I actually got my start as a student at Willamette University. I have a degree in history from Willamette uh, quite a few years ago, so I'm really excited to be back in Salem here tonight. Now, Oregon actually has more ties to the Navy than you might think. It doesn't have a big shipyard like Bremerton or a big Navy presence like, say, San Diego, uh, but nonetheless, U.S. Navy history has actually been really important to this state. Uh, and uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to take a look at some of those pivotal events of Oregon's naval history and all of the individuals who have helped shape it. Now this history is actually quite a bit older than you might think. Uh, it actually goes all the way back to the early 1840s, just like the history of the site where we're at tonight. Uh, now the first US Navy presence in Puget Sound was the arrival of the Wilkes Expedition, led by Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, that, that fellow on the left there. Uh, and um, the main uh, idea of this expedition, which actually went all around the globe, uh, was to do a lot of mapping to help in navigation. Uh, and as, as you might expect, the Pacific Northwest coastline had an increasing number of ships visiting here, so it was especially important that they spend lots of time in the Pacific Northwest uh, to create some accurate maps. But it was a much bigger expedition than that. As you can see from this map, uh, they actually started in August of 1838 uh, for a very meandering journey that left the East Coast and went really all around the world, uh, stopping in various coastlines to make charts and scientific expeditions. Uh, and then they finally arrived in the Columbia River uh, in April of 1841. And the Wilkes Expedition visited uh, Fort Nisqually and Hood Canal and uh, uh, Walla Walla and all, all sorts of different locations in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they returned to the mouth of the Columbia where one of their ships, USS Peacock, was lost on a sandbar. And then they spent the summer of 1841 coming inland uh, to uh, places that actually included Salem. So they came here and they visited with some of those earliest missionaries uh, who were right here. And then they returned east in 1842, uh, taking with them all sorts of scientific materials like plant specimens and fossils. And then they wrote and published lots of volumes all about their voyages. And uh, they also published many maps, including this one of the Oregon Territory. The Wilkes Expedition really quite literally helped put the Pacific Northwest on the map. Now, coincidentally, one of the ships that was involved in the Wilkes Expedition was named USS Oregon, named in honor of Oregon Territory. It was a former trading ship that they actually bought in Astoria uh, after the USS Peacock had been wrecked and they needed a replacement vessel. Uh, it was in commission until 1845, so a fairly brief service with the Navy, uh, but she would be the first of three US Navy ships named for this state. Now, of course, because she served in the 1840s, we have no photos of her, uh, but this illustration shows what the ships that took part in this expedition would have looked like. Now, the next USS Oregon uh, was a battleship. It's probably the, the most famous USS Oregon that served, uh, and it was in service in 1896 to 1919, uh, which meant that she served in the Spanish-American War. Uh, she also visited Bremerton's Puget Sound Navy Yard lots of times over her career, and this photo of her is actually from my museum's collection. USS Oregon was also a museum ship up in Portland uh, during the time between the World Wars, and today her mast can still be visited in Portland, where it's at a park up there. And this is the current USS Oregon. It's a Virginia-class attack submarine, which keeps the name alive in the fleet. Uh, she was just commissioned last year and is stationed over in Groton, Connecticut. Oregon's connections with the Navy continue through the naming of ships for locations all around the state. Uh, during World War II, there were Navy ships named for Astoria and Coos Bay, 
Eugene and Mount Hood, among others. Uh, there's actually also been a U.S. Navy ship named for the Willamette River. It's USS Willamette, the ship shown here. And she was an oiler, so her job was to refuel ships that were out to sea. In service during the 80s and 90s, uh, she performed more than 1,300 underway replenishments, totaling 300 million gallons of fuel. Now, after the early 1840s with the exploring expedition, there wasn't a significant U.S. Navy presence here for a couple of decades. Uh, now, there were a few ships that visited during the Civil War, uh, mostly Union warships that came up from California to try to combat Confederate raiders that, that operated a little bit uh, up and down the Pacific coastline. Uh, but aside from the occasional ship visit, Oregon really didn't see much Civil War activity. Uh, but the state's ties to the Civil War do include the contribution of soldiers and sailors uh, who fought in the war from Oregon. This is one of Oregon's earliest naval officers, Lieutenant Roswell Lamson. He'd actually arrived uh, via the Oregon Trail as a child. His family had a homestead up near Portland. He attended the Oregon Institute, which later became Willamette University. And then he was the first cadet from Oregon to attend the US Naval Academy. He graduated in the midst of the Civil War and served in the Union Navy aboard the gunboat USS Washington and then USS Gettysburg, which was actually the fastest ship in the Navy's fleet. So it was a pretty big deal. Uh, and in the early 20th century, there were three U.S. Navy ships named in his honor. Uh, so I think Lieutenant Lamson can safely be considered our state's first naval hero. Now into the early 1900s, there were really no major attempts to put permanent Navy facilities anywhere in Oregon. Uh, but soon after, there would be two major developments that would bring a naval presence to the state. First, the Navy started developing a series of Navy radio stations all up and down the coastline. They were designed to transmit messages to and from ships that were out at sea, and they were really all up and down the coasts of Oregon and as well as Washington and California. Uh, there were short-lived stations uh, in all sorts of little communities. Uh, this particular one was taken at Cape Blanco, which is down near the southern edge of the state. And secondly, there was kind of an interesting development. There was a naval militia. Uh, this was roughly the, the Navy's attempt to approximate the Army National Guard, uh, but it was actually run by the state of Oregon. Uh, and it's something that several states uh, undertook in this era. Uh, so in Oregon, the naval militia was established in 1910, and the Navy lent it a cruiser, USS Boston, the ship shown here, and sent over a small group of U.S. Navy officers that would train up this crew. There were about 200 naval militia members at its peak, uh, and then when the United States joined World War I, all of the naval militia ships went back to the active duty Navy, and the members themselves also reported for wartime duty with the Navy. The program eventually merged with the U.S. Naval Reserves after World War I, and it was no longer operated by the state of Oregon. Now, one of the members of this uh, short-lived militia was uh, Louis T. Barron, Jr. He was the first naval aviator to come from the state. Uh, right before World War I broke out, he trained as a naval aviator, and he was about to return to Oregon and hopefully add a naval aviation branch of this small naval militia. But then, of course, the Oregon Naval Militia got folded into the U.S. Navy, and Lieutenant Barron found himself serving in the U.S. Navy as Naval Aviator Number 56. So he really got in on the ground floor that. Uh, he was both an instructor and a test pilot. Now, the Naval Militia and the radio stations were just the start of the state's organized efforts to support the Navy. As soon as World War I broke out, there were uh, shipyards in Portland and in Coos Bay and Astoria. 
uh, about a dozen Oregon shipyards in all that secured government contracts to build both wooden and steel ships for the war effort. You can see a wooden hull just starting to take shape in this wartime photo. But really for me, in the Willamette Valley, World War I is primarily a story of service. It's a story of people, not of places. Uh, though the region didn't have any significant Navy installations during the war, Salem contributed hundreds of soldiers and sailors for the war effort. There were about 3,000 Oregonians who served in the Navy during World War I. And while it would be impossible to do justice to every story of service originating uh, in the state, shown here are seven of Oregon's sailors, including a pair of brothers who served during the war. They served as radio operators, musicians, submarine electricians, pharmacist mates, and lots of other duties. Now, as you can imagine, Salem residents were very glad to welcome their loved ones home at the end of the war. And shown here is a victory parade that was held here in Salem at the war's end. And it actually comes from the collection right here at the Willamette Heritage Center. Uh, and for those curious, it was taken on Court Street near High Street. Now, unfortunately, not every family was able to celebrate the victory at the war's end. Of the several thousand who had served, there were 88 soldiers and sailors from Marion County who had lost their lives in service during World War I. Now, between the World Wars, Salem continued to send sailors into naval service. Here's one of the most famous sailors to hail from Oregon. Uh, his name was Thomas Gatch, and he was born in 1891 to a fairly prominent Salem family. His grandfather had been the president of Willamette University. His father had served as the town's mayor, and Thomas himself attended the US Naval Academy, graduating in 1912. He later earned an, a law degree and spent a large portion of his career in the Navy's Judge Advocate General, or JAG, office. He also served several tours of duty at sea, including famously as the commander of USS South Dakota, a battleship, during World War II, uh, where his ship participated in important naval battles like Guadalcanal. He was actually wounded at Guadalcanal and eventually retired as a vice admiral in 1947. Now Salem and the surrounding Willamette Valley saw much more activity during World War II than in the previous war. The US Navy actually had quite a bit going on here in Oregon. There were several naval air stations, there was a blimp base, there were lots of training facilities, and in addition to these Navy-owned facilities, the state was also plenty busy producing goods for, uh, that would be needed for the war effort, notably at the shipyards in and around Portland, but really all over the state. And of course, thousands of Oregonians served in all branches of the military during the war. Now, perhaps most famously, the cities of Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington became a major shipbuilding center during the war. They produced literally thousands of ships. And of course, Salem's proximity to these shipyards meant that uh, many of Salem's residents ended up finding jobs in these shipyards. Up in Portland, the Kaiser Shipyards Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation churned out uh, hundreds of ships to carry cargo, move troops, and participate in crucial naval battles throughout the Pacific. Uh, they built something like 2,000 ships during the war years, uh, with really incredible speed. Uh, they built about half the aircraft carriers that were built in this country during World War II. And um, that industry actually topped out at around 100,000 workers during the war years. Uh, so it was quite the production. Now many Salem residents would have been drawn northward to the promise of shipyard work. Uh, but they were replaced by others drawn to the wartime industries that were in and around Salem itself. In the 1940s, Salem's population jumped by more than a quarter, from about uh, 32,000 to 43,000, as industries in and around Salem grew to contribute to the war effort, uh, sending their output to be used by soldiers and sailors around the world. 
the fertile Willamette Valley provided a wide variety of crops from fruit to sugar to grain for the war effort. And three Salem fruit canning companies had government contracts to provide food for the armed forces. And the Thomas K. Woolen Mill also got in on the effort. Shown here is an image from the Willamette Heritage Center collection. This is Talitha Magel Newson. She was a weaver at the Woolen Mill right around the war years. Her husband had joined the Navy after high school graduation and he was away serving aboard USS Franklin during the war. And I like her story because it is so reflective of the story of so many of those workers during the war years. Uh, they awaited their loved ones return from the military while they themselves were contributing to the war effort. Now the largest Navy base here in Oregon during the war was in Astoria uh, and Tongue Point, uh, which is located right up there on the Columbia River. It had been a naval radio station early in the century, then was developed with the intention of actually becoming a submarine base around World War I. Uh, but that plan never quite came to fruition. And finally, during World War II, it gets developed as, uh, among other things, a base for flying boats that were stationed there to conduct patrols. But perhaps more importantly, Astoria was a buzzing center of activity for all those ships that were built in Portland and Vancouver because they came through Astoria as their first stop in Navy service. Uh, so they would be commissioned or placed into service in Astoria uh, where they were prepared for their crew members uh, who would often come directly from boot camp to Astoria to board their ships and head off to the Pacific. Now at any given time there were about 3,000 members of the military permanently stationed there along with uh, hundreds of others who were just passing through. And at the height of the war nearly one escort carrier a week was commissioned right in Astoria. Uh, including this one, which is probably one of the most famous ones, but also the saddest story. She was built in Vancouver. It's the escort carrier Lis USS Liscombe Bay. She was commissioned in August of 1943 and immediately sent over to the Pacific, where in November of that year, she was hit by a torpedo attack. And she sank very quickly, uh, taking 644 sailors with her. And the loss remains the deadliest sinking of a carrier in the history of the U.S. Navy. These sailors would have come through Oregon on the way to the Pacific and then never returned home. Now, after the war's end, a vast fleet of Navy warships ended up in Astoria in mothballs until they were slowly uh, sold off over the years and the Navy remained there until the 1960s. Though Astoria was the largest Navy base during World War II, it was not the only one. Uh, there was a smaller and shorter lived Naval Air Station in Klamath Falls Airport uh, where fighter pilots would train. They conducted bombing practice over nearby reservoirs before they shipped out to the Pacific. There were additional naval air stations in Clatsop County, in Corvallis, uh, in Lakeview, and a few other places as well. There was also one uh, at Tillamook Naval Air Station, and it was given a very special job. It was a blimp base. Uh, from Tillamook, blimps, uh, like the one in the illustration here, would patrol to look for enemy ships and submarines. Uh, this base had giant hangars to house the blimps, uh, each of the two blimp hangers uh, covered more than seven acres and was a thousand feet long. Uh, so the blimps that operated here, there was a squadron of eight of them. Uh, they were 250 feet long and would go out for 48 hour missions to patrol up and down the coast uh, as far as California and the Canadian border. Now right here in Salem, there were several naval offices during the war. Uh, they were primarily related to recruiting efforts. Uh, and at Willamette University, there was a Navy V-12 unit. Uh, this was a program designed to increase the number of officers in the Navy. So it was a college training program. They would go to Willamette for training and then become officers in the Navy. 
Uh, at Willamette, Lausanne Hall served as the main facility for these officers uh, who were mainly being trained as medical personnel and deck officers. And it was nicknamed USS Lausanne for the duration of the war. Most of the wartime facilities that were built up all around the state during the war were intended to prevent a Japanese attack on the Pacific coast. Right? They, would, they would send out patrols to make sure there was nothing coming in. Because at the time, this seemed like a very real possibility. And in fact, it was. There, there was never the large scale invasion that they were preparing for. There were some smaller scale attacks. In June of 1942, a submarine shelled the shoreline at Fort Stevens, though it caused limited damage. And then in late 1944, Japan launched balloons carrying bombs, which would drift over uh, high in the jet stream until they reached the mainland. Now, there were an estimated 45 of these that actually landed in Oregon, as well as some in other states. Uh, but the only casualties for, from such bombs occurred in Oregon. In May of 1945, a pastor and his wife and a group of children were out for a picnic east of Klamath Falls, and uh, they unfortunately found the remains of a balloon that had drifted there. They accidentally triggered the bomb, and it killed the wife and the children. And this tragedy really showed Oregonians that the war was closer to their shores than they had thought. Not only did the areas around Salem operate a number of major naval facilities, but Salem residents also found themselves in the war effort. In fact, Oregonians were contributing to the war directly from the very start uh, with Pearl Harbor. Now this is a story that I first heard at Willamette University uh, in about 2005, long before I ended up uh, working for the Navy, but it's really stuck with me all that time. See, on the morning of Pearl Harbor, Willamette University's football team was over in Hawaii. They were very excited to be playing a football game over there and then taking some time to be tourists. Uh, but of course the world had other plans for them. Uh, so as soon as the attack on Pearl Harbor was over, all of those uh, football players as well as some of the fans volunteered to serve guard duty alongside Navy sailors as the cleanup efforts went into full swing. And they actually finally returned to Oregon about two weeks later aboard a ship that was carrying wounded troops to the mainland for medical care. Now, Willamette's football players were not the only Oregonians who were at Pearl Harbor on that fateful morning. There were about half a dozen other sailors with ties to Salem who were also there. And at least 15 Oregonians died at Pearl Harbor. Shown here is one of them. Delmore Setterstrom moved to Minnesota to, from Minnesota to Salem with his family as a teenager. He graduated from the University of Oregon, and then in 1941, he became a Supply Corps officer with the Naval Reserve. He reported aboard the battleship USS Oklahoma in August of 1941. And he was on board, reportedly conducting payroll duties on December 7th, 1941. And during the attack on Pearl Harbor, 451 sailors from that ship died, and Setterstrom was among them. In his honor, USS Setterstrom, a destroyer escort, was named. Commissioned in September of 1943, it escorted convoys and de delivered supplies throughout the Pacific. It supported the Battle of Iwo Jima and the invasion of Okinawa. And the ship's bell can actually be found on display right here in Salem at the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs. By the war's end, many families in this city had lost loved ones. Salem had lost an estimated 142 sailors and soldiers. For those looking for a place to honor their service and sacrifice, there's an Oregon World War II memorial located just a few blocks from here on the grounds of the state capitol. And there are also uh, several places in this area to honor the veterans and service members from other wars as well. Uh, outside the Marion County Courthouse, there's a marble sculpture that stands as Salem's memorial to World War I veterans. 
And uh, over near the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs building, there are six memorials to the state's military veterans, past and present. Now, while most of the large Navy facilities that are located in Oregon closed down at the end of World War II, there have been a smattering of Navy facilities that have remained open since then. And one of these was even located right here in Salem. Uh, in the late 1940s, the Navy established a Naval Air Reserve Training Detachment over at McNary Airport. It was operated by Naval Air Station Seattle and was home to as many as 1,000 aviators who were based all around the Willamette Valley area and were serving in the Naval Reserves. This meant that they'd no longer have to go all the way to Portland or Seattle for training. There were about 10 planes in operation at a hangar at McNary Field. And though, though the Navy portion of that airport has long since closed, uh, there continues to be an air training facility uh, up in Boardman, Oregon, which is in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, it uh, was main, is mainly used by personnel from Naval Air Station Whidbey Island up in Washington for training and testing relating to aircraft and drones. And Oregon is also home to two Navy support centers, one in Portland and one in Springfield, that provide administrative services, training support, and other programs to serve the state's active duty and reserve sailors. And thus concludes the long saga of Oregon's relationship with the Navy, from the 1840s arrival of naval explorers through the service of the battleship USS Oregon to the many sailors sent from the state to fight in World War II, Salem's connection to the US Navy runs deep. So thank you.